If you are a seller, if you're making money already on Amazon, why did you decide to deal with people? Uh, and I was trying to calculate. I'm like, listen, if I would decide to sell this Creole and I will source it from China, you just cannot beat this competitor because this competitor created the niche. Tumor in Mexico, it's a terrible uh, shopping experience. Uh, what the hell? Like, this is not what I paid for. I would have gotten something else if I knew this. So like all of these hurdles make it very difficult for brands to expand to Latin America. I have friends down here that are doing two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a month in sales of their supplement products because they are the main products that are here on the market. That inventory is no longer yours. And if you don't trust these people, if you don't know these people, you're essentially risking everything that you just sent to the country. What is the timeline of all those approvals? The cost of advertising is extremely low. Your cost per clicks are a fraction of what you're going to be paying in the U.S. I thought I, I'm being scammed. Like seriously, I was like, and I was checking like every single order, and I was googling this people. Like, oh. Isabella Reed on Amazon Made Simple podcast again here with you and we're about to talk Amazon, how to make Amazon simple because if a lot of people are thinking it's pretty hard, it's complicated, should I start Amazon, should I not, how to expand, should I expand, should I not expand my business on Amazon and we're about to answer those questions today with Michael Bagg. He is former and current Amazon seller so he knows how to sell and he's also having his agencies. So, so do I. And uh, a lot of people are usually asking us questions like, okay, if you sell, why do you have agency? And this is how probably <laughs> I will start <laughs> our uh, session today because this question I'm getting a lot and then we will jump into the details. How guys, you can expand your business to Latin America. This will be the main uh, topic of the podcast and stay with us. Uh, Michael, welcome. Isabella, thank you for having me here. That was a great introduction, and I'm excited to talk to you today about Latin America. Yeah, we're going to talk about Latin America, but first, tell me, answer the question that I'm always answering for people. <laughs> if you are a seller, if you're making money already on Amazon, why did you decide to deal with people? Um, I mean, it really was like a time thing. The great thing about selling on Amazon is that it's not really a full-time job. You can make money on the side. You can do it as a side hustle. You can, you know, have people pretty much manage everything for you. And it was just really coming down to it is that we wanted to put myself and my two partners, we wanted to take more advantage of the time that we had uh, and the skills and the knowledge we had of selling on Amazon and then turning it into a service. I mean, when I started AMZ Advisors, uh, this was back in 2015. So there really weren't many other agencies or service providers out there. Uh, we were selling products in the art supply category, uh, and we still sell products in that category, but, uh, we were competing against Crayola and Crayola right. is a massive brand. So Crayola is a massive brand. They are massive. Yeah. They're so cheap. And like, I remember yeah. it was time when I was selling, um, third party and the Crayola was one of the brands we've been selling and we've been buying from the distributor, I believe like something like one to two dollars. And, and I was trying to calculate. I'm like, listen, if I would decide to sell this Crayola and I will source it from China to ma source, manufacture, ship it here, it is no way I can have this one to two dollars. It's been a while back and I could not understand how Crayola been making money by selling their stuff so cheap. So how did it go? How did you it, compete then? How uh, was the brand? We had mixed results, but uh, we had some cat product categories that were uh, a little bit more niche than what Crayola was focused on. I mean, Crayola is known for its markers. It's known for its crayons, colored pencils. Um, so once we kind of moved a little bit outside of the marker category, we found a category that was great. Uh, from day one, we started selling. We were doing 25 units a day of our private label, which was awesome. We were excited about that. Uh, we expanded into some other paints and some other uh, aspects on the art supply side. And we then tried to get a little bit more aggressive, I would say, and tried colored pencils. And we got smoked on colored pencils uh, by by Crayola. So uh, this entire- Was it like, hard to compete because of the price point, because yeah. of the feature of the product? Price point and uh, specifically with colored pencils, 
this was like we were still new sellers at this point we didn't understand like the whole importation process we were just buying you know stuff on alibaba at that point uh there is a significant tariff on chinese colored pencils for some reason so that pretty much drove our our cost of good uh it almost doubled it 100 percent. and we yeah the price point on crayola's colored pencils are insanely cheap um so we just got completely smoked out of the competition colored pencils we ended up pretty much donating most of them uh because we couldn't sell through them why not uh it's just that that's it wasn't deduction worth it. right yeah exactly we took it as a, a loss as a tax deduction we wrote it off and like it's better than spending all the money on advertising trying to churn a, a product That's that we good. were losing money on every sale. Yeah, if it's a loss, just take it as a loss. Don't try to exhaust the situation. Like I totally agree. And by the way, uh, for the new sellers, it's a great insight when you're going into the niche that's been created by the brand. So, and it's not about you can be better, you can have better features, you just cannot beat this competitor because this competitor created the niche. So don't go against the Apple, don't go, go against Crayola or Mercedes. It's just not the way to go about launching the new products on Amazon included. So if you would be launching Amazon all over again, what niche would be in your mind? um the niche that i sell or right what now, niche would not be in your mind yeah i mean supplements would not be in my mind <laughs> supplements okay. is just too crazy competitive uh you know it's a good market there's a ton of sales in it but the level of competition is super high the cost of advertising is super high uh i personally i sell food products now uh i love food um not only to eat but i also love <laughs> selling the products because there's so many barriers to entry uh of it and there's so many it's so many cost and expenses for for sellers to be able to even just get the products approved uh so i really love being in that category um especially then, right now when you can do like low calories feeling exactly you can find like anything yeah you're being in shape and you're eating something like on the go you can take it on a plane and you don't have to be worried be hungry yeah that's great i love this yeah um uh, so tell me more about uh expanding for example if you like you're selling food how do you expand this food to latin america so uh food, food's probably not the best example uh, i actually manufacture my food in mexico and bring it to the u.s so i okay. do the, vice versa um but for example uh, i'll just say um a, a okay baby i'm product. selling Let's drink, say... i'm selling drinkware i'm okay. selling drinkware i'm selling something no we don't sell babies yet we're thinking actually about the baby product but yeah let's talk about drinkware one of the uh our niches so how can i expand it to latin america so the main way you can do it and this is what a lot of sellers are already doing is they're using the north american remote fulfillment program uh the narf program has a lot of trade uh, trade-offs i mean obviously it gets you into into mexico and into brazil and selling in those markets but as a consumer and i live in mexico uh as a consumer in mexico it's a terrible uh, shopping experience. Uh, drinkware, not specifically, but there are many categories where there are import tariffs uh, to Mexico that are not included on the actual purchase. So for example, uh, I've bought products before where I'm spending $100 from through the Amazon Mexico platform to buy a NARF product that's coming from the US and it arrives and they go to deliver it to me and they're like, ah, oh, here's your tax bill. It's another $50, $60. I was like, well, what the hell like this is not what i paid for i would have gotten something else if i knew this so uh that's correct and we are facing the situations a lot especially uh like when we were we still have some products that like we removed for inventory from amazon it wasn't it didn't make any sense but they're still like we still have them as a merchant yeah. uh and sometimes we're having this occasional sales like i don't know 20 30 a week uh to mexico yeah. And people have to pay uh, not just shipping, which is like insanely crazy when we're shipping from here, but they also have to pay the local tariff in Mexico. Yep. And then we've been uh, getting a couple of refunds, a couple hundreds of refunds or requests to be refunded, to have the refund. Like, uh, listen, I didn't know I have to pay local taxes when I'm receiving the package. I want to make a refund. And we've been like, that was a huge surprise for us. And like some products were really canceled. We didn't want to sell there. But yeah, that's the problem. 
Yes. And that's a massive problem that a lot of people have as sellers. And it's really the only option you have. The only yeah. way to get into FBA in Mexico is to have a tax ID in Mexico. And the only way to have a tax ID in Mexico is to have a business in Mexico. And the only way to have a business in Mexico is to have a Mexican business partner. So like all of these hurdles make it very difficult for brands to expand to Latin America. And at the same time, like it gives the consumer a terrible shopping experience. Mercado Libre is the other big platform here, <clears throat> here in Mexico and Latin America. They have the global selling program, which is essentially the same thing as NARF. Uh, they ship the products from the U.S. to other consumers. But again, the consumer experience is terrible. So like when you're expanding to Latin America, there are better ways to do it than using the NARF program. That's like the shortcut. And both programs, uh, NARF and global selling, are just taking advantage of a tax loophole. Um, but it, it honestly is just not great for the consumer. So you're saying that if... I want to avoid taxes in Mexico. I have to ha have a partner. So in your case, you have your wife, right? So that's why you probably can create the business in Mexico. Am I correct or incorrect? Uh, it's not my wife, but yeah, I mean, I have partners here that I'm, you know, that I'm, I trust that I'm friends with. Like, yeah. that's exactly the problem is like, if you don't know anyone here, how are you going to do that? And even beyond that, like, there's still a ton of requirements to do it as a foreigner in, in Mexico. But yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly so what you have mean. to have the connections with locals that you trust yeah exactly to be able to start a business uh and just so you know like once that's done then you need to get all of your your passports your birth certificate uh all your legal documents apostilled and sent to mexico to a lawyer to have a lawyer approve it and then they need to you actually need to go to mexico if you're not here and then sign documents so it really is a, a pain in the ass for most sellers to actually deal with that unless they have a product that has a massive potential. That's really the only time we see them uh, okay. you know, go through all the brain damage. So if like what type of products have a massive potential in Mexico? In Latin America in general and not Mexico, the yeah, three biggest America. categories are uh, electronics. There's a ton of demand for electronics. The reason why is that most Latin American countries have a import ban on Chinese electronics. So U.S. electronic bands actually have an advantage if they're manufacturing in the U.S. Oh, yeah. Um, supplements is another one. Uh, the supplement categories, same thing in the U.S. You would need to get FDA approval in most in instances for a consumable product. Uh, you have to get the approvals down here as well. You still need all the hurdles we talked about before with a business and partner and everything. Plus, on top of that, you need to go through the approval process, which is a whole nother nightmare. Uh, and then beauty products, cosmetic products. Those are the three biggest categories, in my opinion, uh, for Latin America. And we so work it, as partners with Mercado Libre. And those are the categories that they have told us they are trying to get more sellers for. So initially you said you would never launch or you would not want to launch supplements, but it's based on US. You would launch supplements for Mexico. Yes, I would. And I know I have plenty of friends down here that are doing it. Uh, the let so for example, let's just say protein powder. Protein powder market in the U.S. is crazy saturated. Cost per clicks are twenty twenty five dollars sometimes. Yeah, in Mexico, okay. yeah, the cost per clicks are two dollars or less. Yeah, you're competing against maybe four or five other big brands in Mexico. The the competition, the level of competition in supplements is so much lower. Now, there's a the reason for that is all the barriers to entry. Again, it's a huge problem, and once you figure out how to navigate those. You can do a significant amount of sales here, but I have, I have friends down here that are doing two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a month in sales with their supplement products because they are the main products that are here on the market. So, when you are uh, conducting the demand of the products, do you go um, through like different type of software, same like we do in the United States, or you are being based on just? local and like local investigation local insights insight information or like I, I really don't know how mexico and latin america works like we usually use just the software but because you are inside of the country maybe you will tell us more i, I would say that the the softwares work uh in mexico pretty well uh the numbers yeah. are fairly accurate but when you look at what the broader e-commerce market is you need to understand that amazon's not the only platform in mexico uh, fifty percent of consumers shop on Amazon, fifty percent shop on Mercado Libre. So you're losing pretty much half of the market if you're not on both platforms. And again, the only way to do that is really to have your product and a business in the country. Um, 
so when it comes to calculating sales, the Amazon platform is the, the best way to start from there. And you can kind of project what the sales are. And then just imagine that it's really about a hundred, uh, it's not really about double that because you're not taking into consideration the other platforms that you have access to. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the softwares work, uh, the numbers are pretty accurate and you can use them to start kind of checking out the markets to see so what works. So if we're not using NARF and if we're not, I mean, like we're using NARF, but if it's not about NARF, if it's not about, uh, partners, if I don't have any partners, like how can I reduce my taxes? So how can I go to Latin America? Yeah. And now that you bring up taxes as well, you, that's a very good point as well. Uh, there's different loopholes here. So you could in theory, in theory, uh, import your product to Mexico to a 3PL and have the 3PL fulfill it. You can't use uh, FBA again because you don't have a tax ID. If you are not a registered taxpayer in Mexico for your business and you use the 3PL, Amazon's going to keep 20% of every sale as tax. So that's another thing to consider is that they're going to take a massive tax. Uh, they're going to hold on to a massive amount of your money as, as a tax claim back. Um, there are a variety of different ways to get into Mexico. If you do not want to use the NARF program, uh, one specific way would be to work with a, a distributor. Uh, that's usually the easiest way. And obviously you have to prove to the distributor that your, pro your product has a good demand in the market. Um, you know, we help the brands with the distributor there. Yeah. Yes, a distributor here in Mexico. So if, just to be clear, if I'm on private label, I'm, I am have to contact the distributor and tell him like, listen, I have this product, you have to buy from me. So in this case, I'm selling to distributor, I'm not selling uh, just like piece by piece. Yeah, yeah, you can't you can't do DTC without uh without the tax ID. So without the business, okay. it's not possible. Uh, okay. So the way that we help brands specifically in Latin America is that we have our own distribution company and we have our marketing uh, team. Okay. So what we do is we will uh, get the product from the client that wants to sell. We'll help them get on to uh, sell it, you know, Amazon uh, from D to C without the importation tag in Mexico. Okay. Mercado Libre, Liverpool, Walmart, Copal, all the platforms here and try to get them into retail distribution. So that is the way that is the way that gives you the access to the most people. There is another shortcut as well where you can buy an RFC. There's a And then the sales will be happening under your account. So you kind of get in the uh inventory as at net cost, right? And uh, then you are paying to the sellers after the sales will be happening. Yeah, we we pay the money back to the sellers and uh after that's, the sales that's essentially happen. the way it works yep after the sales happen yeah okay um so but i mean I'm that's not listing under my amazon account in latin america in this case yeah. unfortunately you can't uh there is this other way to do it which is you essentially can buy a it's like a sub tax id there's a there's a weird rule in mexico where a corporation can create multiple sub tax ids but it's not clear there's a whole lot of risks with this, but it's not clear whether the subtasks that task IDs tie to the other tasks, uh, tax IDs, and you don't know what liabilities you have for them. Plus you don't know what that tax ID is being used for, for other things. So that is another route. I would really not recommend the safest route. Uh, and the most direct route to do it is working with the distributor because at the same time, once that product hits Mexico, whoever the importer of record is, on paper, it is their uh, inventory. If you're using okay. someone else's tax ID, like like I said, you might have multiple businesses assigned to one tax ID with this other uh, thing. That inventory is no longer yours. And if you don't trust these people, if you don't know these people, you're essentially risking everything that you just sent to the country. Nice. That's so much fun, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it reminds me of the country where I came from. So. Uh, in this case, uh, the question comes to like money. For example, my manufacturing here, let's just talk numbers. So my manufacturing here for supplement, let's say eight, nine dollars, if we're talking about something like decent-ish, right? Uh, I'm shipping it to you probably additional like 20, 30 percent I'm paying for shipping from this inventory. So it comes like let's say eleven dollars, eleven, twelve, mm -hmm. right? So uh, what would be uh, 
what's supposed to be the the fair distributor price for this inventory to be able to resell it and still have some margin on top. So, I mean, the good thing is that uh, Mexican consumers and Latin American consumers in general are already used to paying more for product. Uh, the expectation might be that prices would be lower, but in fact, they're not. There's uh, value add taxes baked into the price of every uh, product. Um, and in general, because most products are being imported from foreign countries, the prices are going to be higher no matter what. So there is, uh, I mean, again, it's tough to say whatever the supplement may be, but uh, you may find that the prices are competitive to what you would be charging in the U.S., However, the cost of advertising is going to be significantly lower. So from a margin standpoint, you actually may have a better margin in Mexico per sale than you would have in the U.S. Uh, when it comes specifically to distributor margins, I mean, that depends on each and each company that's out there and how they negotiate the process. But at the end of the day, you might be able to uh, have a, you know, a 30, 40, 50% markup on your product as you sell it to wholesale and still have enough money for the distributor to make money on the end sale. Nice. So if we will just come down to how you work with this uh, process. So if I'm like, okay, I want to sell my supplements. I exited my supplement brand in 2021. Uh, but let's say like I have non-compete agreement only for those supplements and the skincare that was there. But let's say I want to do it again. Uh -huh. uh, and people will say, huh, this is the pattern. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's say I want to do my supplements. I want to do skincare again. And uh, I'm reaching out to you. I'm saying, okay, I have this type of inventory. So what's next? What's happening? The first process would be that we would need to help you get the FDA approval. FDA, it's a different Mexico? agency down here. I mean, yes. Latin America FDA? In each country, yeah. So yeah. in Mexico, it's called Cofe Pris. And we would help you get the Cofe Pris approvals. Uh, for the product, once you have the Kofi Pris approvals, we would need to make sure that the product labels are in Spanish. Uh, we can do that with a, a simple sticker that can be done uh, at our warehouse before it comes over. It can be done at the warehouse once it arrives. Uh, really just depends. It just needs to be in Spanish to go to the end consumer. Um, and yeah, from there, it's just a matter of getting the product up. So uh, those are the hurdles that you're going to face with a supplements brand is getting the different approvals. Uh, but Beyond that, once you have everything approved, it's easy to just get started selling. Uh, what is the timeline of all those approvals? Uh, Kofi Priest, depending on the product, can take anywhere from two weeks to six months. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it does take some it's time. It's like, oh my God, and oh my God. <laughs> two yeah. weeks is nothing and six months is a lot. Yeah, so there's really no in-between. It really depends. But when you look at some of the other delays, like I just... In general, Mexico is not ideal for, for doing business, uh, and Brazil is even worse. Um, from my experience starting a business here, uh, it took four months to get the business formed. It took another three months to get the tax ID. So we're looking at seven months just to get a business up and running. And then from there, there's a whole other load of requirements that we need to get done. Uh, the product is supposed to be already manufactured, or the product can be in process and you just need a sample? Uh, we would just need a sample actually. Um, if you have the existing, like if you have it in some type of sample packaging of what it's going to look like from there, it's easy to get the approvals. But, um, again, it's just timelines. Like I, I said, Mexico, Brazil takes 12 to 18 months to form a business, uh, as a wow. foreigner and, and you still have the same hurdles that you need a local business partner. So there are a lot of reasons that a lot of sellers are not focused on Latin America. And it's mainly because of these hurdles but there's a massive opportunity for the sellers that are thinking about moving into Latin America and not just on Amazon, but on every platform. That's interesting. So, and you're helping to expand to this Cabo Libra and to uh, local Amazon, of course. So in a local Amazon, uh, are you guys listing under your, do I understand you're listing those brands under the, your Amazon account? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the only way that Amazon works. Um, so we have to go about it that way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we do. And from there, you will be managing PPC and you'll be managing everything else. Yep. The great thing is that we have a team of, uh, over 50 employees here in Mexico. And obviously that's all native, uh, Spanish speakers. Localization is easy yeah. from the content standpoint and advertising standpoint. So we handle all of that in-house for our clients. It's not great, guys, how like one day you're being born, you don't know what is going to happen. Then you're at some point 
dating the girl or the guy that uh, are from the different country and this is how your new business starts like double business spouse business partner business and now you're in a different country helping other people to be in a different platform so it's it's really great uh so to summarize everything um uh, when somebody wants to expand to latin america we have to have a partner we have to have tax IDs, uh, we have to go through the process of approvals. If we're selling supplements, we need the certification. You guys are helping with that. And uh, the moment everything is done, uh, our product's supposed to be listed on different type of the platforms that are locals, that locals are trusting. And uh, then you are helping to manage all this stuff and helping people to make a lot of money. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we help with. Um, and that, like I said, the platform is like, I would say it's like wide open. It's, it would be like selling back in 2015. Again, uh, the competition level is extremely low. Your cost of advertising is extremely low. Your costs per clicks are a fraction of what you're going to be paying in the U S there's so many reasons that it makes sense to be down here selling. There's just a lot of hurdles that are preventing a lot of people from doing it. And that's exactly what we're trying to solve. So, and if we're not talking about supplements, if we're talking about like normal products, um, I believe the barriers are lower. Yes, the barriers are lower. If it's a normal product, uh, we have a, a compliance team that just checks if there's any import tariffs we need to be aware of. Obviously, that has to get factored into a, the uh, the entire customs process. But apart from that, if the product has no restrictions, no, it doesn't need approval with any government agency, we can get up and running within a month on selling a product. Yeah, you'll be surprised. In 2016, I sold, I don't know how much, how many, but it was like a lot of um, action cameras to Mexico. And that was the time when I was learning. So I didn't know actually how to sell correctly, what yeah. to do. I just listed this action camera without a brand, without anything. Just I thought I have a brand. I didn't have a brand. But anyway... I listed the section cameras and I got so many uh, orders from Mexico. I thought I, I'm being scammed. Like, seriously, <laughs> I was like, and I was checking like every single order and I was Googling these people. I'm like, no, all these people are like normal, real people. <laughs> and I remember I was paying like $16 per shipping, which was not much. Like I was selling for like hundred something dollars, the section cameras. I was making so much money, so yeah. much money by selling there till I got shut down by Chinese people. But it's a different story. That was my very, very learning experience. And I remember electronics to mexico worked back in the days very well and like you're proving that it's still it still worked yeah. okay sounds great so if we're talking about electronics, that's my one of the last questions so if we're talking about electronics that we want to expand to latin america what do we do is like any msds certificates that like local msda certificates or how people should go about it or you're just checking with the compliance team and then you will just come back with the feedback yeah, the compliance team will give us all the feedback on what we need to import. The main thing is product safety. Uh, so I believe we can use the same product safety sheets or the manufacturing safety sheets uh, that are provided. Um, it's just a matter of usually getting it translated to Spanish to make sure that uh, it's compliant in that standpoint. But there's a massive, I mean, you, you just spoke to it. There's a massive demand for electronics down here. Uh, yeah. So if you have an electronics brand, this is a great opportunity to be here. Um, we... Mercado Libre sent us a list. I think of it was like 10,000 different products they were looking for. And like 90% of the list was electronics. So they know the opportunity. Uh, obviously, you know the opportunity, Isabella. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of getting down here and getting your product in here legally for you to be able to start selling. Okay, so I will make sure all your contact information will be under this uh, video or voice podcast. Depends what are listening or watching because we're posting in both and this is definitely super valuable and it's an opportunity and like i'm doing a lot of podcasts a lot of them are valuable with information this one is actually actionable and uh, genuinely speaking if you guys are already selling this is once you are one step away for from having a partner existing partner in latin america that can take your hand and walk into the doors where you will be able to increase uh, your revenue uh, by 34%, from my understanding, from you already 
having in the United States, or maybe actually more, because if you cannot get uh, enough of uh, market share in, on Amazon.com, you'll be able to get probably 80 or 60% on Mexico or Brazil, in Mexico or Brazil, because the demand and the competition ratio is different there. And Michael, thank you for being here today. That was really, really valuable. Isabella, thank you for having me. I'm happy to share uh, everything I know about Latin America. And we barely just scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more we could go through, uh, but hopefully this mot motivates some people to start paying attention to Mexico and Brazil. It definitely should. At least it should to motivate a lot. It, it motivated <laughs> me. If it's motivated me, it will motivate other people as well. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.